Today's episode of Scaling Up H2O is proudly sponsored by the Association of Water Technologies. AWT has been the backbone of the water treatment industry for over 35 years. AWT is your place to learn more about water treatment with opportunities such as wastewater training, sales training, basic water treatment training, and technical training. AWT's publication, The Analyst, provides tips, tricks, and new technologies to help you enhance your water treatment programs. To find out more about AWT or become a member, go to awt.org. Welcome to the podcast where we scale up on our knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Scaling up H2O. I'm your host, Trace Blackmore, and we are at the very last show of Legionella Awareness Month. And I hope you have learned something this month. I hope you don't just learn something about Legionella this month. You use this to continue learning because as I've said before, we as industrial water treaters getting better information to take to our customers so they can make better decisions. Folks, we can end Legionnaire's disease. We can all be making better decisions and that all starts with knowledge. So you all have sent in your questions to me and today we are going to answer those questions. Now I'm gonna answer some of those questions and I've got some very special guests that are also going to answer those questions right along with me. So with that, I wanna make sure that we talk about a few things before we get into those questions. And the first thing is the Association of Water Technologies is having their interactive convention September 30th through October 2nd. Next week, we're gonna be hearing from AWT president, Tom Brandvold. Tom's gonna share his story about being an industrial water treater, but he's also going to tell us all about this year's virtual convention. Yes, this year is going to be different. Let's face it, what hasn't been different in the year of 2020? But in this case, different isn't bad. Different is just different from what we're used to. And because it's different, we're actually gonna have some tools that we've never had before. And these tools are going to enhance your experience. In fact, these tools take care of a lot of issues that I have when I go to a conference in person. Of course, we all love going in person, but one of the things is we cannot go to every single paper because they have multiple ones going on at the same time. Well, folks, this year you can. You can see every single presentation, read about it, you can get information on it, download all the handouts, and you are not limited to only being in one place at one time. So that to me is huge because I hate missing the things that I want to see. So again, different doesn't necessarily have to be bad. Different is going to give us some more tools than we normally do. Now, Tom's gonna to tell us all about those tools and why we need to be sure that we attend this year's virtual convention. Now, if you haven't registered, it is not too late to register. You can simply do that by going to awt.org and clicking on convention registration. They make it very easy for you to do that and then you can experience this year's virtual convention. Now, immediately following the AWT convention is Industrial Water Week. That's gonna be October 5th through 9th. And Nation, I'm so excited. We have joined forces with founder of the Industrial Water Week, James McDonald. That's right. So James and I have joined forces. You do not wanna miss what we together have in store for you. Of course, each and every day, we're gonna bring you a brand new, carefully packaged 
episode for your listening pleasure. And if you've forgotten the days of Industrial Water Week, so we're going to be celebrating pre-treatment on Mondays, boilers on Tuesdays, cooling on Wednesday, wastewater on Thursday, and then we wrap it all up with careers on Friday. We have fun with this each and every year. You might remember a couple years ago, this is where we started doing a weekly podcast. And since that time, oh my goodness, have our numbers grown. The folks out there in the Scaling Up Nation, of course, you know who you are. You're listening to me right now. You have done a tremendous job of each and every week listening to these episodes. And I think by having it each and every week, you have been able to form a habit of listening to Scaling Up H2O, and I am sure glad you did. So please stay tuned to hear all of the fun ways that James and I are going to enhance your Industrial Water Week experience this year. Well, Nation, again, I wanna thank you so much for letting me know what questions you have about Legionella This whole month, it's what can we learn about the bacteria so we can eliminate Legionnaire's disease. And I truly think we can if we start making better decisions. So let's listen to our first question. Trace Blackmore, Mark Lewis here. Hey, thanks for bringing us Legionella Awareness Month. My question to you is with the many different forms of Legionella, Sarah Group 1 through 14, uh, blue, white, et cetera. Is there a different disinfection procedure for the different types of Legionella serum groups? Should we disinfect at higher levels or at lower levels for a longer time? Depending upon the type of uh, Legionella that we test positive for, knowing that we're going to test positive for something at some time. My question is, is the proceed disinfection procedure the same for everything? Or do we modify our disinfection procedure depending upon the, the type of Legionella we have? Thanks for bringing us Legionella Awareness Month, and thanks for scaling up H2O. Well, to answer that question, we have none other than friend of show, Dr. Janet Stout, president of Special Pathogens Laboratory. So what do you think, Janet? Well, the answer actually starts with how do we treat the disease, Legionnaire's disease, whether or not Legionella pneumophila causes the disease or Legionella mcdadii, for example, causes the disease. The antibiotics that we use to treat both of those work just the same. Azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin. doesn't matter which type of Legionella species has infected the patient, those antibiotics work equally well. So the same is true with disinfection approaches. There might be slight differences in the susceptibility of these organisms to the disinfectant, but not enough to make a a real-life difference because we're using so much chlorine dioxide, monochloramine, copper silver ionization, for example. And so we use enough to overcome even the slightest difference in susceptibility. So if you have a water system that's colonized with Legionella mcdadii, you would use the same disinfection approach as if it was Legionella pneumophila. Well, Janet, thanks for that answer. Well, let's go ahead and move on to question number two. So, Trace, it's clear that there are um, more breakouts of Legionnaire's disease in the summer months. Uh, and why, why is that? Uh, rather than the winter months, it seems that the, the warm weather may have an effect um, on the disease itself. So the question is, why do we have more Legionella outbreaks? And when I say Legionella, I mean Legionnaire's disease. And I do want to take a moment to go over that in a second. But I'm going to finish asking the question, why do we seem to have more outbreaks of Legionnaire's disease in the summer rather than winter? So uh, first off, uh, just some terminology again, because the better we speak, the better uh, we can talk with our customers. So Legionella is the bacteria that infects uh, us, and Legionnaire's disease is the same thing as saying Legionellosis. So if you hear those terms, those are interchangeable, and of course, that's the pneumonia form disease that we don't want. 
So uh, to answer that question, it really depends on what you're looking at. So if we're looking at utility water, like a cooling tower, or maybe we're looking at pools and spas, uh, people are more active in the summer. They're going out, they're doing more things. Of course, there's more load on our cooling systems. So those are getting utilized more. So for those types of systems, you will see an increase of Legionnaire's disease detections within that time frame. Now, if we truly look at the culprit of where most people get Legionnaire's disease, it's from the domestic water. And those systems use the same pretty much all year round. But as we know, it's those other systems like the cooling tower that get all of the press. So really in answering this question, it really depends on what piece of equipment that you are looking at and then determining when the biggest month of outbreaks are. But to simply answer your question, of course, there's no way to simply answer anything. But since we have a limited time on this show, I'm going to say it really depends on what you're looking at. And if we are looking at the cooling towers, of course, we have more cooling towers in use during the summer. And those cooling towers are being used to their fullest capacity during that time. So that's why that would be the prime time that we could see that. Our next question has to deal with those hot water systems that we were just talking about. And this person wants to know, how do we mitigate the risk and hot water systems. Now I've asked my friend and fellow Rising Tide Mastermind member, Brian Fisk, to help us answer that question. When managing the hazards for domestic water distribution, the first step should always be development of a water management program to provide a defensible backbone that guides the decisions of the facilities teams. Once the risk basis has been established, the team can properly analyze how they can control the hazards present. The controls available for domestic hot water systems are temperature and residual oxidant concentrations. By working through the guidance provided by the regulatory drivers, the team will assess how to manage their systems through what is called the hierarchy of control. What this means is to work to control the hazard through the solutions in a way that goes from simplest to most complex. Once a control is established, it should be verified that it's being implemented as designed, and then its efficacy should be validated before moving to more complex controls. Brian, thanks for that. Of course, if we don't have a plan, we really don't know how to coordinate everybody's efforts. And I know plans don't specifically say you have to test, but I gotta tell you, if you're running a plan and you have no way to validate if it's working or not, I can't think of any way to do that other than testing. So uh, with the hot water system, heck, with all the systems that we're talking about here today, making sure that you understand the plan, making sure that there is a team behind the plan, and then the proper people are executing the items to make sure that wherever there are some hazard locations, we are doing what we need to do. We're testing to make sure that that is working, and then we simply wash, rinse, and repeat. Let's hear our next question. Hey, Trace. uh, Emma Wilson here with Innovative Water Consulting. How should buildings that have still not opened after the COVID-19 shutdown kind of prepare their building and and more so prepare their water system uh, for that reopening process? Well, thank you so much for that question. I've invited my friend, Bill Pearson, to come on Scaling Up H2O and answer that question. Well, some of the services you may need to ensure a safe reopening will include disinfecting and cleaning of water systems, such as cooling towers and storage tanks, certainly that are set, uh, you know, stagnant. Also, flushing protocols will be very, very important to ensure that you have been or are moving water through the building, getting rid of the old and bringing in the new is the only way you're going to establish disinfectant levels. Uh, You may possibly have to do a disinfection and flushing, such as uh, hyperchlorination of the building water's entire domestic water supply, 
uh, in systems, hot and cold. I would certainly be remiss not to emphasize at this time the role of analytical testing of the building water systems for Legionella. This is the only way to ensure that your conditions are acceptable. You may do this testing first as a risk assessment, followed up by remediation or uh, some level of action plan, but you always want to validate the effectiveness of any such uh, uh, actions or remediations and do Legionella testing. And last but not least, the implementation of a water management or safety plan on a long-term basis. Well, Bill, thank you so much for answering that question. Hey, thank you for all that you did in those years where, and I think it was 10 plus years, where you were working hand in hand with ASHRAE and AWT, making sure both sides were staying informed as 188 was being developed. Now, folks, on episode 140, friend of show Janet Stout visited us, and this was actually a special episode that we turned into a podcast episode from a webinar that we did for our mastermind group. So during the pandemic, while we were all staying at home, we did 13 webinars that you can find at scalinguph2o.com, and you can go to our resources page. You can see all of those webinars, and one of them was Janet talking about what we need to expect when we're reopening our buildings, and then also how we should be talking to our customers about that. Well, we turned that into a podcast, so you are welcome to watch the webinar. Of course, Janet's got some great slides if you do it that way. But you can also go to episode 140, and you can hear that there as well, where Janet pretty much takes the entire episode to answer that question. Thanks again for that question, and we've got a lot more. All right, let's get another question from the Scaling Up Nation. My question is about Legionella sampling. Where is the proper location in a cooling tower to collect your sample? And then how is that sample procedure performed? Nation, in searching our Scaling Up H2O archives, I think Janet answers this question perfectly. So if you will, listen with me as I take a sampling from episode 121. In the case of a cooling tower, what you want to do is answer the question, is the water treatment program working to control Legionella? So you don't collect the sample right where you added the biocide and right after you've added the biocide. You collect the sample right before the next dosing and away from where the dosing is occurring. That tells you whether or not the program is controlling Legionella and whether you need to make any adjustments to that. So that's how you collect the sample. The method of testing, what you want to make sure, and remember, you know, there's a lawyer on my shoulder. What you want to make sure is that you're doing a standard method in an accredited laboratory that knows how to do microbiology. So you don't want to be doing Legionella testing in your garage. You want it to be done by people who are professionals. Why? Because they will give you the right result, not just a result, right? And it's defensible, right? Always with the little lawyer on my shoulder. So that's a decision that you have to make who's going to be doing the testing and what method. And it should be in an accredited laboratory. You know, and there's all kinds of requirements for a laboratory for accreditation and proficiency to demonstrate that the methods that are being done and by the people that are doing them are to standard. And for Legionella, standard culture is the gold standard. And of course, I've mentioned before, Janet Stout is a friend of the show, great member of the Scaling Up Nation, Great resource of knowledge when it comes to Legionella. Uh, She, of course, calls herself a Legionellologist, and she has her PhD in Legionellology. Folks, if you search back through our archives, just like I did, you're going to find so much information. Of course, this month, we're just talking about Legionella. And just talking about Legionella, I think I already mentioned episode 140, where we're talking about reopening buildings. 
Janet, where I took the sampling, was episode 121, but she also was on the previous episode, 120. We were talking all about Legionella. We were talking about how ASHRAE had updated their document. We had Matt Farigi come on on episode 83, and he talked all about water management plans. And folks, the list goes on and on and on. So I encourage you to go on scalinguph2o.com, get on the search bar, search for a topic that you are looking for, and it's going to pop up and you can learn some more information about it. Let's go ahead and listen to our next question. Hey, Trace, how you doing? It's Chris Golden from Taylor. Could you do me a favor and explain the mechanism of how Legionella can get into a system through the drinking water, municipal water system? Thanks for all you do, bud. Bye. Chris, thanks for that question. So many times we think, or our customers think, that if there's Legionella in water, it must mean that something has failed. And that's not the case. We need to look at the bacteria itself. And the fact of the matter is that that bacteria, Legionella bacteria, is naturally occurring in freshwater sources. So our drinking water, it's, it comes right in with that. Uh, of course, our municipalities do some things to sterilize, but there are long runs that go throughout from where they uh, make the water safe for us to drink to where they pump it to where we can actually drink it. There are so many miles of piping. And of course, that disinfection wears off and then biofilm occurs and we are bringing Legionella into the drinking water that we are bringing into the system. Now, is that a huge deal? Well, let's look at that. We know that Legionella is naturally occurring in freshwater systems. So why is it such a big deal when it gets into our facility systems. Well, that's the issue. We've now done something with the water. It's now not in a lake, river, or stream. It's in a building system where it's not necessarily flowing and it can continue to grow. So in lower populations, probably not that big of a concern, but as it continues to grow, as it continues to multiply, and then we put it into systems that give it a delivery process where we can vaporize it, we can turn it into a mist, and now we're inhaling that, we're getting it into our bodies, and that's the concern. So it's not that when we have a Legionella management plan, a water management plan, that we will never have Legionella ever, ever, ever again. Folks, that is impossible. What a plan states is that we realize that Legionella is coming in with the water that we're getting from the city because it's, it's naturally occurring. But when it does, because we know it is, We're going to test for it, and we're not going to allow it to multiply freely and then just see what happens. We're going to test for it. When it gets to a certain range, when we detect it, we are going to knock it down with some sort of disinfection tool. We've talked about several of them here today, and we're going to continue talking about that. So, Chris, I hope that answers the question. And I think that's where the term Legionella is ubiquitous. And then we hear our customer says, well, if Legionella is all around us, why do I need to test? Well, that's the answer to that question. You need to test because we're changing the Legionella that would be in a lake, river, or stream. And now we're cramming it into a system where it can eat, grow, and multiply. And that is the issue. Let's listen to our next question. During this time, if you are a COVID-19 patient and have uh, contracted coronavirus, uh, are you then more vulnerable, Trace, to Legionnaire's disease? That, does that put you at a higher risk? Or similarly, vice versa, if you have Legionnaire's, um, are you more, uh, you know, more susceptible to COVID-19? When we first started out Legionella Awareness Month, I gave a very high-level view of what the symptoms are with Legionnaire's disease. And a lot of you had written in and said, hey, that sounds maybe even similar to the COVID-19 symptoms. How do we tell them apart? 
And folks, that's really an issue right now. Uh, doctors are looking for COVID-19. I'm not sure how much they're looking for Legionnaire's disease. But the question was, are you more susceptible if you've had COVID-19 to get Legionnaire's disease and vice versa? Well, on that first episode this month, we talked about the people that are at most risk for Legionnaire's disease are immunocompromised individuals. Now, the fact is we do not know what the long-term effects of COVID-19 are. A lot of people make speculation, but folks, let's face it, right now that's all it is, is speculation. We're gonna learn as we live through this together as we have everything with COVID-19. But if it does weaken the immune system, sure, that's going to put you in a more risk category for Legionnaire's disease, especially if, if you're getting exposed to that. Now, people that have had Legionnaire's disease, well, that is a pneumonia. Folks, that has to do damage to your lungs. So that's meaning that you're also immunocompromised based on that, even if you do recover. Now, the body is remarkable how it can recover from illnesses, but I would think that you would also be more susceptible for COVID-19. So as I get more information, I will definitely share it with you. I did reach out to a couple of doctors, and unfortunately, they were not able to get back with me in time for the airing of this episode. So as more information becomes available, I will be happy to share it with you. Our next question comes from a person that runs a hospital system, and they want to know what is the best course of action when Legionella is detected? What type of disinfection should they use? So I asked my good friend, Brian Waymeyer to weigh in on what the options are. Thanks for the question. Uh, so the first part of the question is, is, how do you determine which secondary disinfection program to use? Well, right now, there's pretty much four main secondary disinfection systems out there. So there's monochloramine, uh, which is the Sanapure system that can do the hot water. There is uh, chlorine dioxide, which I think there's a couple different manufacturers out there. Uh, copper silver, which uh, has its own issues. And then uh, good old fashioned, just, you know, sodium hypochlorite or chlorine. And uh, the second is, you know, with the feedback available, which disinfectant shows the best long-term success? Well, I guess the jury would always be out on that. Uh, we've had a lot of good success with monochloramine systems. Uh, you know, the Santa Pier system is, is very good. They are, uh, you know, out of uh, Baltimore, very good company, and it's, it's been shown to work very well. But it's uh, not always what I call a silver bullet. So there's not a silver bullet with any four of them. Uh, as I always will say, a really good water management plan, along with a secondary disinfection system, uh, will go a long way. However, I will caution everybody to make sure that they do their homework on those secondary disinfection systems and the regulations within each state. Uh, each state has its own uh, certain regulations. For instance, uh, Pennsylvania requires a licensed operator to as install any secondary disinfection system. So cost-wise, you know, most of them for copper, silver, chlorine dioxide, monochloramine, they are priced pretty much in the same range, uh, depending on how big your system is. Uh, chlorine and uh, sodium hypochlorite is usually, uh, of course, you know, the least expensive. Uh, but corrosion issues are always going to be an issue with all three of them, except for the copper silver. Uh, we have to, I guess there's some probably some corrosion studies out there. And the last thing he says, cost should be also be considered, but override other considerations. Well, as I said, that secondary disinfection system in those states, finding a licensed operator can be very cost prohibitive. Uh, we did, did do, do a quote in Pennsylvania for a monochloramine system uh, that required a operating permit to do that system. And it was somewhere in the $150,000 to install. And then the operations, it was almost $3,000 a month for that operator. So hopefully those answer some of your questions. Well, thanks so much for that, Brian. Of course, this month we learned some different tests. I know a lot of you are using different types of Legionella tests out there besides the culture method. And with that, you have contacted me and said you had some more 
questions. So I invited my friend, of course, we've heard her several times on the show already. Janet, thank you so much for all you do. She's going to answer a couple of questions that you had. So here's Dr. Janet Stout once more. Well, qPCR stands for quantitative polymerase chain reaction. And qPCR measures the amplification of a DNA sequence or a gene. It measures how many copies are made, and how many copies are made is dependent on how many Legionella bacteria were in the sample to start with. So, for example, if there were fewer Legionella bacteria to start with, it would require more cycles of amplification in order to reach a certain threshold of detection. If there are more Legionella bacteria in the sample to start, then the threshold is reached faster. We can use this to estimate the quantity, hence the Q in qPCR, the quantity of Legionella in the sample. So the accuracy of qPCR is totally dependent on the sequence of that gene that we're using to probe for the bacteria. And we have found that when you're probing for the whole genus, multiple species, qPCR is vulnerable to false positivity. And you've also heard of the fact that PCR detects both dead and live Legionella. So there are little tricks um, uh, to doing it effectively. In our hands, we've found the qPCR for Legionella pneumophila and Legionella pneumophila serogroup 1 to be very accurate. So that's why we do that test just for Legionella pneumophila Yes, no, and specifically for Legionella and Haemophilus serum 1. So I hope that helps you understand what exactly is qPCR. Thank you. So folks, hopefully those terms mean a little bit more now, and you now know where you can start using those tests. Now, uh, Jenna's going to answer another question where we learn more about these rapid tests. So now let's hear a little bit more on that from Dr. Janet Stout. Here's another good question. What is the advantage of a quick Legionella test? Well, besides stating the obvious that it's fast, the question of kind of what's the advantage has to do with how accurate that test is. And the accuracy in scientific terms is is, uh, discussed as sensitivity and specificity. What that means is, is it truly positive or is it truly negative? Many of the quick tests suffer from lack of sensitivity, meaning it's Legionella's there, but they're not detecting it. And some suffer from a lack of specificity, meaning that they're picking up something else, giving a false positive. It's not really truly negative. So the answer to the question is you have to know and delve a little bit deeper into the particular test to know how sensitive and specific that test is. And if there are any problems, for example, with false positivity, that could be a big problem, like yelling fire in a theater when there's no fire. Scaling Up Nation, again, I want to thank you for thinking of what you did not know this month in Legionella Awareness Month. Of course, we're celebrating Legionella Awareness Month because of the Legionella Conference that the NSF normally has that pretty much this very week, but they've postponed that to January. Surprise, uh, another conference that has been changed. Folks, it's just the time that we live in. 2020, what a year. So, but it is, it is my hope that you are continuing to learn. You're continuing to ask each other questions. You're continuing to educate everybody around you that needs to understand Legionella bacteria and Legionnaire's disease. And I hope if we do this next year, that we can report that we are just such an educated society that we are so low on Legionella cases, Legionnaire's disease cases, that it's just something we do. It's just something we test, but somebody hardly gets sick because we start with that good information and we make better decisions from there. As I mentioned, we got a lot of things coming up 
We've got Tom Brandvold next week. He's going to be sharing everything you wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask about the virtual event that AWT is having instead of a live conference. And folks, don't just say you're not coming because it's not going to be a live conference. Trust me, there is going to be reasons for you to be there. And there are going to be tools to allow you to take advantage of things that you have never been able to take advantage of before. Until the meantime, which is next week, next Friday, when I bring you a brand new episode, please continue learning and do something different to help us end Legionnaire's disease. Have a great week, folks. Scaling Up Nation, on episode 136, I invited four members of the Rising Tide Mastermind to tell the Scaling Up Nation a little bit about being a member of the Rising Tide Mastermind. I asked Connor Parrish to explain what our weekly meeting looks like, and here's what he said. Every week we are, are able to meet, and I think it's great that we do it weekly because it keeps us accountable. But every week we meet for an hour and it's very structured that hour. Um, we come in and we check in to see is there anything that we need to follow up on or report to the group from an accountability standpoint that we said we would get done by a certain date. And the nice thing is we, we record that and then follow up each week um, to make sure everyone is achieving what they were supposed to do. If we had reading, one of the things that's nice about this is we uh, have a sign reading for books that it's not too cumbersome if you don't like to read, but I think there's a lot of value um, and the pace is great. So we will discuss any key points from the reading there at the beginning and kind of work on some general you know, housekeeping. And then from there, we really start to dive in uh, to what we call being in the middle, which is where one of the members of the group each week comes with a problem that they want to present. So this starts by that member describing the problem to the group and then indicating, you know, what is the goal that they want to accomplish from, you know, the discussion that's about to ensue. So from there, everyone will then spend maybe 20 minutes or so asking clarifying questions in which everyone is doing exactly that, asking questions and the person in the middle then responds. There's no back and forth dialogue at this point, it's just clarifications. And then from there, once we feel as a group that the problem is understood and all the questions are answered, we move forward to providing recommendations. Each member of the group then you know, gives them insight and some feedback based on what they heard to the person in the middle, who finally then kind of compiles all of that advice and says, okay, this is, this is what I'm taking away from the advice of the group. And here's what you can expect from me as far as tackling the problem and hopefully resolving it within the next couple of weeks, depending on the scale of the problem. Well, Nation, there's the secret sauce. That is the format of our meeting. And it's all about getting where we're going faster. But it's also about making sure we're starting out in the right direction. When was the last time you asked yourself what was important to you? And are you doing the things that are going to make those important things happen? Those are the things that we're discussing in the Rising Tide Mastermind. And can you imagine how much more successful you would be if you had a boardroom of people helping you with your issues, letting you know what your blind spots are and holding you accountable to get the things done you said were important to you. Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind to see if the Rising Tide Mastermind is right for you. And if it's not, it's okay, but please find a group that is right for you. We are not built to do life alone.